Hi, and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. Today we're reading from Heidi, starting with Chapter 14, Sunday Bells. Heidi was standing under the waving fir trees waiting for her grandfather, who was going down with her to grandmother's and then on to Dorfley to bring up her trunk. It was Saturday, a day when Alm Uncle made everything clean and neat inside and outside the house. He had devoted the morning to this work so as to be able to accompany Heidi in the afternoon, and the whole place was now as spick and span as he liked to see it. Well, now we can be off, he called cheerfully as he came out. They parted at the grandmother's cottage, and Heidi ran in. The grandmother had heard her steps approaching and greeted her as she crossed the threshold. Is it you, Hi child? Have you come again? Then she took hold of Heidi's hand and held it fast in her own, for she still seemed to fear that the child might be torn from her again. She had to tell Heidi right away how much she had enjoyed the white bread and how much stronger it had made her feel already. Brigitte said that she, sh she was sure if her mother could eat like that for a week, she would get back some of her strength, but she was so afraid of coming to the end of the rolls that she had only eaten that she had eaten only one as yet. Heidi listened to all Brigitte said and sat thinking for a while. Then she suddenly thought of a way. I know, Grandmother, what I will do, she said eagerly. I will write to Clara, and she will send me as many rolls again, if not twice as many as you have now. I had ever such a large heap in the wardrobe, and when they were all taken away, she promised to give me as many back, and she would do so, I am sure. That is a good idea, said Brigida, but then they would get hard and stale. The baker in Dorfley makes the white rolls, but I can only just manage to pay for the black bread. A further bright thought came to Heidi, and her little face lighted up with joy. Oh, I have lots of money, Grandmother, she cried gleefully, skipping about the room in her delight. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I know now what I will do with it. You must have a fresh white roll every day and two on Sunday. Peter can bring them up from Dorfley. No, no, child, answered the grandmother. <clears throat> I cannot let you do that. The money was not given to you for that purpose. You must give it to your grandfather, and he will tell you how you are to spend it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But Heidi would not listen. She continued to jump about, saying joyously over and over, Now Grandmother can have a roll every day and will grow quite strong again. Oh, Grandmother, she suddenly exclaimed, still more happily. If you get strong, maybe everything will grow light again for you. Perhaps it's only because you are weak that it is dark. The Grandmother said nothing, for she did not wish to spoil the child's pleasure. As Heidi went jumping about, she suddenly caught sight of the Grandmother's songbook, and another happy idea struck her. Grandmother, I can read now. Would you like me to read you one of your hymns from your old book? Oh, yes, said the grandmother, surprised and delighted. Can you really read, child, really? Heidi had climbed up on a chair and had already lifted down the book, bringing a cloud of dust with it, for it had lain untouched on the shelf for a long time. Heidi wiped it, sat down on a stool beside the old woman, and asked her, asked her which hymns she should read. What you like, child, what you like. The grandmother pushed her spinning wheel aside and sat eagerly waiting for Heidi to begin. Heidi turned over the leaves and read a line out softly to herself here and there. At last she said, Here is one about the sun, grandmother. I will read you that. <clears throat> the grandmother sat with folded hands and a look of indescribable joy on her face, such as Heidi had never seen there before, although at the same time the tears were running down her cheeks. As Heidi finished, the grandmother begged, Read it once again, child, just once again. So Heidi, as pleased as a grandmother, read the hymn again. Ah, Heidi, that brings light to the heart. What comfort you have brought me. The old woman kept on repeating the glad words while Heidi beamed with happiness. She could not take her eyes from the grandmother's face, for it had never looked like that before. It had no longer the old troubled expression, but was alight with peace and joy, as if she were already looking with new clear eyes into the garden of paradise. <coughs> Excuse me. Someone now knocked at the window, and Heidi looked up and saw her grandfather beckoning her to come home with him. As she was going out, Brigitte ran to her with the frock and hat she had left. Heidi put the dress over her arm, but she refused to take back the hat. Heidi could hardly wait to tell her grandfather of her plan to buy rolls for the grandmother. The money is yours, he said. Do what you like with it. You can buy bread for Grandmother for years to come with it. Heidi shouted for joy at the thought that Grandmother would never need to eat hard black bread again. Oh, Grandfather, she said, everything is happier now than it has ever been in our lives before. 
If God had let me come at once as I prayed, then everything would have been different. I should have had only a little bread to bring to Grandmother, and I should not have been able to read, which is such a comfort to her. God has arranged it all so much better than I knew how to. Everything has happened just as the other grandmother said it would. And now I shall always pray to God as she told me, and always thank him. And when he does not do anything I ask for, I shall think to myself, it's just as it was in Frankfurt. God, I am sure, is going to do something better still. So we will pray every day, won't we, grandfather, and never forget him again. And suppose we do forget him, said the grandfather in a low voice. Then everything goes wrong, for God lets us then go where we like. When we get poor and miserable and begin to cry about it, no one pities us. But everyone says you ran away from God, and so God, who could have helped you, left you to yourself. That is true, Heidi, but where did you learn it? From Grandmama. She explained it all to me. The grandfather walked on for a little while without speaking. Then he said, as if following his own train of thought, And if it is so once, it is so always. No one can go back, and he whom God has forgotten is forgotten forever. Oh, no, Grandfather, we can go back, for Grandmama told me so, and so it was in the beautiful tale in my book. You have not heard that yet, but I will read it to you as soon as we get home. When they reached the hut, the old man sat down on the bench. Heidi soon came running out with her book under her arm. In a second, she was beside him and had her book open at the story she wanted. In a sympathetic voice, Heidi began to read of the prodigal son when he was happily at home and went out into the fields with his father's flocks. The picture showed him dressed in a fine cloak watching the sunset. But then, all at once, he wanted to have his own goods and money and to be his own master. And so he asked his father to give him his share, and he left his home and went away and wasted all his money. And when he had nothing left, he hired himself out to a master who had no flocks and fields such as his father had, but only swine to keep. So the young man was obliged to watch these, and he had only rags to wear and a few husks to eat, such as the swine fed upon. Then he thought of his old happy life at home, and how kindly his father had treated him, and how ungrateful he had been, and he wept for sorrow and longing. And he thought to himself, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Here Heidi paused in her reading. What do you think happens now, grandfather? She said. Do you think the father is angry and will say to him, I told you so? Well, listen now to what comes next. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Isn't that a beautiful story, grandfather? asked Heidi as the old man sat without speaking. <clears throat> she was surprised that he, is, that he had not expressed pleasure and astonishment. You are right, Heidi. It is a beautiful story, he replied, but he looked so grave as he said it that Heidi grew silent herself and sat looking quietly at her pictures. A few hours later, as Heidi lay fast asleep in her bed, the grandfather went up the ladder and put his lamp down near her bed so that the light fell on the sleeping child. Her hands were still folded as if she had fallen asleep saying her prayers, and an expression of peace and trust lay on the little face. The grandfather stood for a long time gazing down at her. At last, he too folded his hands and with bowed head said in a low voice, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am not worthy to be called thy son. And two large tears rolled down the old man's cheeks. Early the next morning, he stood in front of his hut and gazed around him. The fresh, bright morning sun lay on mountain and valley. The sound of a few early bells floated up from the valley and the birds were singing their morning song in the fir trees. He stepped back into the hut and called up, Come along, Heidi. The sun is up. Put on your best frock, for we are going to church together. <clears throat> Heidi was not long getting ready. It was such an unusual summons from her grandfather that she had to hurry. She put on her smart Frankfurt dress and soon went down, but when she saw her grandfather, she stood still, gazing at him in astonishment. Why, grandfather, she exclaimed, I never saw you look like that before. I never saw that coat with the silver buttons. Oh, you do look fine in your Sunday coat. 
The old man smiled and replied, So do you look fine. Now come along. He took out his hand in his, and together they walked down the mountainside. The bells were ringing in every direction now, sounding louder and fuller as they neared the valley, and Heidi listened to them with delight. Listen to, listen to them, Grandfather. It's like a great festival. Excuse me. The, cra the congregation had already assembled, and the singing had begun when Heidi and her grandfather entered the church at Dorfley and sat down at the back. But before the hymn was over, everyone was nudging his neighbor and whispering, Do you see? Um, uncle is in church. At the close of the service, Alm Uncle took Heidi by the hand, and together they went toward the pastor's house. The rest of the congregation looked curiously after them. Some even followed until they saw them go inside the pastor's house. Then they collected in groups and talked over the strange event. Meanwhile, Alm Uncle had gone into the pastor's house and knocked at the stu study door. The pastor shook hands warmly. Excuse me, sorry with him, and Alm Uncle was unable at first to speak, for he had not expected such a friendly reception. At last he collected himself and said, I have come to ask you, Pastor, to forget the words I spoke to you when you called on me, and to beg you not to feel any ill will toward me for having been so stubbornly set against your well-meant advice. You were right, and I was wrong, but I have now made up my mind to follow your advice. I am going to find a place for myself at Dorfley for the winter, for the child is not strong enough to stand the bitter cold up on the mountain. And if the people down here look askance at me as at a person not to be trusted, I know it is my own fault, and you will, I am sure, not do so. The pastor's kindly eyes shone with pleasure. He pressed the old man's hand in his and said with emotion, Neighbor, I am very glad. You will not be sorry, I am sure, that you decided to come live with us again. You will always be welcome here as a dear friend and neighbor, and I look forward to our spending many a pleasant winter evening together. We will find some friends, too, for the little one. And the pastor laid his hand kindly on the child's curly head and took her by the hand as he walked to the door with the old man. He did not say goodbye to him till they were outside so that all the people standing about saw him shake hands as if he were parting reluctantly from his best friend. <clears throat> the door had hardly shut behind him, before the whole congregation came forward to greet Alm, Alm Uncle. Everyone was trying to be the first to shake hands with him, and so many hands were held out that Alm Uncle did not know which to grasp first. One said, We are so pleased to see you among us again. And another, I have long been wishing we could have a talk together again. And greetings of all kinds echoed from every side. When Alm Uncle told them he was thinking of returning to his old quarters in Dorfley for the winter, there was such a general chorus of pleasure that anyone would have thought he was the most beloved person in all Dorfley, and that they had hardly known how to live without him. Most of his friends accompanied him and Heidi some way up the mountain, and each, as they bade him goodbye, made him promise that when he next came down, he would without fail come and call. As the old man at last stood alone with the child, watching their retreating figures, there was a light upon his face, face as if reflected from some inner sunshine of heart. Heidi looked up at him with her clear, steady eyes and said, Grandfather, you look happier and happier today. I never saw you quite like that before. Do you think so? He said with a smile. Well, yes, Heidi, I'm, I am happier today than I deserve, happier than I had thought possible. It is good to be at peace with God and man. God was good to me when he sent you to my hut. When they reached Peter's home, the grandfather opened the door and walked straight in. Good morning, grandmother, he said. I think we shall have to do some more patching up before the autumn winds come. Dear God, if it is not uncle, cried the grandmother in pleased surprise, that I should live to see such a thing. And now I can thank you for all that you have done for me. May God reward you. May God reward you. She stretched out a trembling hand to him, and when the grandfather shook it warmly, she went on, <clears throat> still holding his. And I have something on my heart I want to say, a prayer to make to you. If I have injured you in any way, do not punish me by sending the child away again before I lie under the grass. Oh, you do not know what that child is to me. And she clasped the child to her, for Heidi had already taken her usual stand close to the grandmother. Have no fear, grandmother, said uncle in a reassuring voice. I shall not punish either you or myself by doing so. We are all together now, and pray God we may continue so for long. 
Brigida now drew the uncle aside toward a corner of the room and showed him the hat with the feathers, explaining to him how it came there, and adding that of course she could not take such a thing from the child. But the grandfather looked at Heidi without any displeasure and said, The hat is hers, and if she does not wish to wear it any more, she has a right to say so and to give it to you. So take it, pray. Brigida was highly delighted. At this moment, Peter rushed in. He had a letter for Heidi which had been delivered at the post office in Dorfley. They all sat down round the table to hear what was in it. For Heidi opened it at once and read it without hesitation. The letter was from Clara. She wrote that the house had been so dull since Heidi left that she did not know how to endure it. She had at last persuaded her father to take her to the baths at Regatz in the coming autumn. Grandmama had arranged to join them there, and they both were looking forward to paying her and her grandfather a visit. And Grandmama sent a further message to Heidi that she had done quite right to take the rolls to the grandmother, and so that she might not have to eat them dry, she was sending some coffee. Grandmama hoped when she came to the alm in the autumn that Heidi would take her to see her old friend. There were exclamations of pleasure and astonishment on hearing all this news, and so much to talk and ask about that the minutes flew. All too soon... It was time for the grandfather and Heidi to start up the mountain. "'You will come soon again, uncle, and you, child, tomorrow,' begged the grandmother. The old man and Heidi promised her faithfully to do so. As they had been greeted with bells when they made their journey down in the morning, so now they were accompanied by the e peaceful evening chimes as they climbed to the hut. Chapter 15. Preparations for a Journey the kind doctor, who had given the order that Heidi was to be sent home, was walking along one of the broad streets toward Mr. Sesamon's house. It was a sunny September morning, so full of light and sweetness that it seemed as if everybody must rejoice. But the doctor walked with his eyes on the ground and did not once lift them to the blue sky above him. There was an expression of sadness on his face, formerly so cheerful, and his hair had grown grayer since the spring. The doctor had, had had an only daughter who, after his wife's death, had been his constant companion. She had died only a few months before, and he had never been able to look bright and cheery since. "'I am glad you have come, doctor,' exclaimed Mr. Mr. Sesamon as his friend entered. "'We must really have another talk about the Swiss journey. Do you still stick to your decision, even though Clara is decidedly improving in health?' "'My dear Sussman, I never knew such a man as you,' said the doctor as he sat down beside his friend. "'I really wish your mother were here. Everything would be clear and straightforward then, and she would soon have things straightened out. You sent for me three times yesterday only to ask me the same question, though you know what I think. Yes, I know it's enough to make you out of patience with me, but you must understand, dear friend,' and Mr. Sussman laid his hand imploringly on the doctor's shoulder, "'that I feel I have not the courage to refuse the child what I have been promising her all along.' for months now she has been living on the thought of it day and night she bore this last bad attack so patiently because she was buoyed up with the hope that she should soon start on her swiss journey and see her friend heidi again now must i tell the poor child who is to give up so many pleasures that this visit she has so long looked forward to must also be cancelled i really have not the courage to do it you must make up your mind to it, Sussman, said the doctor with authority. As his friend sat silent and dejected, he went on after a pause. Consider yourself how the matter stands. Clara has not had such a bad summer as this last one for years. Only the worst results would follow from the fatigue of such a journey. It is out of the question for her. Then we are already in September, and although it may still be warm and fine up there, it may just as likely be very cold. The days, too, are growing short, and since Clara cannot spend the night up there, she would have only a two-hour's visit at the outside. The journey from Regatz would take hours, for she would have to be carried up the mountain in a chair. In short, Sesamon, it is impossible, but I will go in with you and talk to Clara. She is a reasonable child, and I will tell her what my plans are. Next May, she shall be taken to the baths and stay there for the cure until it is quite hot weather. Then she can be carried up the mountain from time to time, and when she is stronger, she will enjoy these excursions far more than she would now. Understand, Sesamon, that if we want to give the child a chance of recovery, we must use the utmost care and watchfulness. Mr. Sesamon, who had listened to the doctor in sad and submissive silence, now suddenly jumped up. Doctor, he said, tell me truly, have you really any hope of her final recovery? The doctor shrugged his soldiers. Very little, he replied quietly, but friend, think of my trouble. You have still a beloved child to look for you and greet you on your return home. You do not come back to an empty house and sit down to a solitary meal. And the child is happy and comfortable at home, too. If there is much that she has to give up, she has, on the other hand, many advantages. No, Sesamon, you are not so greatly to be pitied. You still have the happiness of being together. Think of my lonely house. Mr. Sesamon was now striding up and down the room as was his habit when he was deeply engaged in thought. Suddenly he came to a pause beside his friend and laid a hand on his shoulder. 
Doctor, I have an idea. I cannot bear to see you look as you do. You are no longer the same man. You must be taken out of yourself for a while. I propose that you take the journey and go and pay Heidi a visit in our name. The doctor was taken aback at this sudden proposal and wanted to make objections, but his friend gave him no time to say anything. He was so delighted with his idea that he seized the doctor by the arm and drew him into Clara's room. The kind doctor was always a welcome visitor to Clara, for he generally had something amusing to tell her. Lately, it is true, he had been graver, but Clara knew why and would have given much to see him his old lively self again. She held out her hand to him as he came up to her and took a seat beside her. Her father also drew up his chair and, taking Clara's hand in his, began to talk to her of the Swiss journey and how he himself had looked forward to it. He passed as quickly as he could over the main point that it was now impossible for her to undertake it, for he dreaded the tears that would follow. Without pause, he went on to tell her of his new plan. He emphasized the great benefit it would be to the doctor if he could be persuaded to take this holiday. The tears were indeed swimming in the blue eyes, although Clara struggled to keep them down for her father's sake. She knew that he would never refuse her a thing unless he was certain that it would be harmful for her. So she swallowed her tears as well as she could, and taking the doctor's hand, she said pleadingly, "'Dear doctor, you will go and see Heidi, won't you? Then you can come and tell me all about it, what it is like up there, and what Heidi and the grandfather and Peter and the goats do all day. I know them all so well, and then you can take what I want to send to Heidi.' Do go, dear doctor, and I will take as much cod liver oil as you like. Whether this promise finally decided the doctor, it is, is, it is impossible to say. But it is certain that he smiled and said, Then I must certainly go, Clara, for if you do, do, for if you do that you will get as plump and strong as your father, and I wish to see you. And have you decided when I am to start? Tomorrow morning, early if possible, replied Clara. Yes, she is right, put in Mr. Sessaman. The sun is shining and the sky is blue and there is no time to be lost. It is a pity to miss a single one of these days on the mountain. The doctor could not help laughing. You will be reproaching me next for not being there already. Well, I must go and make arrangements for getting off. But Clara would not let him go until she had given him endless messages for Heidi. Her presents she would send round later when Miss Rottenmeyer had packed them. At the street door, the doctor met with a sudden obstacle. Miss Rottenmeyer was returning from a walk and reached the door just as he did. The white shawl she wore was so blown out by the wind that she looked like a ship in full sail. The doctor drew back, but Miss Rottenmeyer had always shown peculiar appreciation and respect for this man, and she also drew back with exaggerated politeness to let him pass. The two stood for a few seconds, each anxious to, get, to make way for the other, but a sudden gust of wind sent Miss Rottenmeyer flying with all her sails almost into the doctor's arms, and she had to pause and recover herself before she could shake hands with the doctor with becoming decorum. She was annoyed because she had been forced to enter in so undignified a manner, but the doctor had a way of soothing smoothing people's ruffled feathers, and she was soon listening with her usual composure while he informed her of his intended journey. He begged her in his most agreeable manner to pack up the parcels for Heidi as she alone knew how to pack, and then he took his leave. Clara quite expected to have a long tussle with Miss Rottenmeyer before the housekeeper would consent to send all the things that she had collected as presents for Heidi. But this time she was mistaken, for Miss Rottenmeyer was in an unusually good temper. She cleared the large table so that all the things for Heidi could be spread out upon it and packed under Clara's own eyes. It was no light job, for the presents were of all shapes and sizes. First, there was a little warm cloak with a hood which had been designed by Clara herself in order that Heidi during the coming winter might be able to go and see Grandmother when she liked. Then came a thick, warm shawl for the Grandmother, in which she could wrap herself up well and not feel the cold when the wind came, wind came sweeping in such terrible gusts around the house. The next object was a large box full of cakes. These were also for the grandmother, that she might have something to eat with her coffee besides bread. An immense sausage for Peter's mother was the next article. A packet of tobacco was a present for grandfather, who was so fond of his pipe as he sat resting in the evening. Finally, there were a whole lot of mysterious little bags and parcels and boxes, which Clara had had a special pleasure in collecting, for each was to be a joyful surprise for Heidi as she opened it. The work came to an end at last, and an imposing-looking package lay ready on the floor. Clara eyed it with pleasure, picturing Heidi's exclamations and jumps of joy and surprise when the huge parcel arrived at the hut. Sebastian came in, and lifting the package up on his shoulder, carried it off to be forwarded at once to the doctor's house. We'll stop there and start tomorrow with Chapter 16. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.